Guten Morgen, mein Herr. Uh, I'm just going to restart my uh, browser because it's using too much CPU. I'll be back. One second. Let's see. Um, like this. Add the stream. Boom. Um, I can't see you in the stream for some reason. What if I click this? No, I can. Epic. Welcome. Good morning. How was your uh, trip to the Baltic? Uh, pretty epic. Um, that was some <laughs> good weather for us. We did some really good miles. And I learned a lot so let me just have a look here so you were actually sailing yeah indeed and sailing myself with obviously with a couple of uh, other people but with full responsibility on our side Hmm, nice. I can actually change the resolution of the camera. That might be a good thing to do. Okay. Um, Ta-da! <clears throat> Word up, Nathan. Hugh Board. I got to... Uh, I was watching um, Hugh Board's stream the other day. He's got that count in. So I was like, I'm going to put that in mine. But he's also got music that plays as well. I've got to get that. That's the next level. We've got someone <laughs> doing some little cartoon heads of us as well. <clears throat> Let me change the All zoom right. and pan on this thing. Zoom and pan. Move over. Ta-da. There we go. Epic. So what are we doing today? Taking over the world. <laughs> oh, just the benchmarking world so yeah i guess it all started with that uh, garage benchmark that you wrote right so why don't you um, summarize a little bit about the what that project was about um okay yeah so the zb garage benchmark it's just like a a garage kind of easy to run single you know run it on a workstation kind of thing that uses docker and it's um Kind of take some configuration parameters. Wonder if I can actually let me see if I can bring it up. Um, it's in my GitHub account. Let's pull the screen off from here. Put that there, and then how do I add my screen? Oh yeah, I can do it like this. If I go two people plus a screen, does that do it? Mm, okay. No. Now I got to. Now I have to share my screen. Um, share screen. Here we go. Um, share screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, share the screen. What do I do now? Uh, share the screen. Share the screen. Oh, goodness.
I think in the future what I'll do is reboot my machine before I start doing this because for some reason, here we go, screen two, share. Yeah, now something is coming. Okay. Yep. Hide. Okay, so uh, garage benchmark. Dun, 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 dun. Ah. Search for it, I guess. Um, how do I search my own profile? Well, let's do it like this. Forward slash ZB garage benchmark. Yep, used to be called that. <clears throat> Here it comes. Yeah. So what this thing does is... Um, I'm not sure we're seeing the right screen. Uh, we have to screen oh, out window. Well, that's pretty dumb. Hang on then. Um, stop the screen. Lols. Share screen. Here we go. Let's try that again. Yes, share the screen. And now choose which stream. Dun, dun. Screen one. Share. Okay. What about... Now. Mm, still loading. Yep, now. Now you can see it? Yes. Very good. Okay. Yep, here it is. Um, okay, so it kind of started off with ZBTPS tests, like transactions per second. How many can you start per second? And basically what it does is you start it with some command line parameters. Minus Z is for, or Z is for which versions of ZB, comma separated list. And there are Docker hub tags for the container image. And then minus T, the amount of time that you want it to run for. <clears throat> That's the number of seconds. You can do minus D to disable back pressure. And it's not documented here, but you can actually run it with a worker to complete the um, processes. But what it does, it'll run, this one example here, it'll run for 45 seconds and just start as many processes as it can on each of these versions. And it will give you like a running total. Da, 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 and there's a, an enhancement that's also not documented, but it gives you a complete report at the end. Oh, and actually, hmm, have I pushed the latest changes? Because you can actually specify the number of partitions to run as well. Yeah, how many partitions you want the, uh, the brokers to have. And that's basically what it does. Actually, it does say here, it says starting ZB0, 22, 5 with two partitions, back pressure disabled. So it's kind of partially documented. So that's basically what it does. And I think it's most useful for comparing the different versions of ZB. More so than, than getting a like, um, you know, what's the maximum throughput that I could achieve with this thing? You know, because for that, you really need to run a realistic setup with, you know, dedicated virtual hardware and, um, you know, multiple brokers, all that kind of jazz. Mm -hmm. But it's just a rough and ready kind of like, you know, I think I kind of think of it like the back of the back of the envelope, you know, napkin sort of um, numbers that you can get something rather than nothing, you know. So okay. that's the the ZB garage benchmark. And so I guess the benchmark itself is implemented in a node and it is. Yep. And then okay. I guess some kind of library to control Docker and um, run the right images or how yeah, does that work? Correct. Yeah. So it has, there's a node library for, you know, orchestrating, um, orchestrating Docker. Wow, my Chrome is so slow. Even just clicking on things on the internet, struggling. And on my good network connection, now it's my CPU. It's just completely going nuts. That must be the streaming <laughs> craziness. <clears throat> yeah.
So that is the uh, the garage benchmark. Okay. Cool. Then, yeah. And then what we wanted to do is to actually look at that and understanding a little bit better uh, how that's configured and what could be maybe better yeah, okay. configurations. And a toy that uh, I developed is um, yeah, a little spreadsheet, or actually a quite big spreadsheet that helps Getting to- Getting bigger all the time. Yeah, indeed, by the, by the day. And um, yeah, that helps to understand a little bit uh, uh, configuration. Because uh, I think what we have um, in, the, in the past is that, um, yeah, people that want to run in high throughput or also sometimes low latency scenarios, um, they, they come to us and maybe throw some numbers over the fence, um, but then it's really hard to compare these things be, uh, unless you really go into all the details. So let me actually share my screen and I'm gonna try this monitor here. And I think, Josh, you, know, you need to put it on the screen for the audience. Yeah, good call. Add the stream. Yes. So, yeah, this is a, a spreadsheet to discuss about benchmark results. Um, we were, people will probably see us going with the head, the head tilted quite a while because, you know, uh, we see the first row here. The labels are all like, 90 degrees tilted. Um, why is that? Because yeah, it's quite a long table and we want to get as much data as possible on a single sheet so we can compare things very easily. And it, uh, it goes in the way that it almost describes a complete ZB configuration in a spreadsheet uh, and also all the other relevant things that might be there. Um, and I think last time we already try to summarize how your garage benchmark is, is working or what configuration it has. But uh, of course, we could go through that step by step to explain how this table is to be read. And um, actually, we can also share this afterwards to um, so people can actually use this for, for their own testing if necessary. So yeah. Um, if one looks at a benchmark in any way, then yeah, it's really important to understand all the different configuration aspects so then the, the numbers can be interpreted. And you shared these outputs here. Let me go a little bit bigger here, um, which give some idea of, for example, how throughput um, evolves. And to put this into perspective, we could now enter the data in here. So, and I think I interviewed you last time already a little bit um, mm. what your benchmark is doing. So the first thing is to understand uh, the process model. Um, and in your case, did we already do this? Yes. So your garage benchmark process is using a fairly simple process. Um, you have basically just uh, a start event, a service task, and an end event, right? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So this um, extra table here, we can analyze a little bit how the model looks like. And um, in, in this case, it's fairly simple. Maybe, uh, do we have this? I can probably just sketch it quickly. So basically your model would look somehow like this. We have just a start event, a service task, and an end event. Um, so that's a sequence. Uh, and that means uh, whatever we do, we will always have these three elements that are executed. Um, so in my, my counting here, that means we have altogether three flow nodes. Um, well, flow nodes. they're not actually executed by default. It just starts mm -hmm. them. They don't actually. Mm -hmm. 
And that's a that's a very good point, right? You're, uh, you're currently focusing on just the start of the workflow. That means the service task itself gets started but never finished, and therefore we also don't run the the end event. End event, yeah. Hmm. How do I count that in my table? Zero. <laughs> One fly node. Yeah. Hey. Wait. Cancel. I would be tempted to say what you start there. So you definitely have the start event. Oh, wait, this is a sum. Um, you have the start event and you have yeah, at least half of the service task because you're starting it, right? And then it's doesn't finish, but it gets started, which is already half the effort from, uh, from a ZB perspective. It's actually the harder part, one could say, because, um, yeah, the creation of a new job and then querying that, that that's um, kind of the bigger part of the of the job. Um, yeah, I don't know. How do I, do I quantify it like that? Maybe. So maybe let's do both. Um, I wonder what happens if you actually start it with minus W. So I guess if we would run it completely, then we would have one service task and two events in there. And then, well, the metrics are fairly similar, fairly simple, but formulas anyway. So, um, and then why do I have two decision, two different uh, distinctions here? The one thing I have is the volume of the happy path or the path that is under test and then uh, the length of a critical path. And just to understand that a little bit, um, I could draw or modify the model. So for example, um, if you have a longer model, then obviously a sequence could go longer like this. But um, so that would give you a pretty long critical path. But what could also happen is that you have stuff in, running in parallel for example, using a parallel gateway. Um, and in that case, your volume increases because you're now running stuff in parallel. Well, actually I should use a parallel gateway for that. Uh, so now these three service tasks here, well, let me actually make them service tasks. They would now run truly in parallel and that means we can run more things at the same time. So the length of the critical path would still be um, yeah, like five or six or something like that here, counting the gateways and the events. Um, but the volume would actually be higher because we're running more tasks. And that can have an, an impact on the benchmark behavior, of course. So it could be uh, something that increases the throughput while still keeping the overall process duration relatively short. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, as always, right? With parallelizing, you can run things in a shorter time. Okay, um, so now we understood the workflow model. Let's go back to this main chart here. Um, I guess I need to give you some more space at the start. Yeah, so here we have the benchmark just starting. Um, then the, uh, the first important thing is to really understand the load generation, how that happens. And there's all sorts of tools that, uh, that people can use to uh, generate load. For example, um, yeah, you could do it like you did, just write, write a little program yourself. Um, since the, the engine is doing the harder part of the work, it's usually quite easy to even just use a single thread or a small program to um, ingest load into the system. Um, 
or if you want to go more, let's say, uh, run more advanced patterns, there are tools like JMeter or Gatling or um, yeah, NeoLoad, for example, that could be used to generate load with a tool suite that, that could also then scale out and uh, yeah, ingest larger volumes if necessary. So in your case, um, you're just using a Node.js program to generate the load, right? Yes. Um, then obviously uh, an important question is which actual ZB client is being used for starting the workflows. Mm -hmm. uh, and then distinguishing here for the client for the starter, and we will later have a section on the job worker, which um, will then also discuss how jobs are being executed. Many times that might be the same. It might even be the same application that both starts workflows and uh, executes the jobs. But um, yeah, it could also be different. Therefore, we differentiate it here. And from a starter perspective, it's a very important thing to understand whether this is multi-threaded or single-threaded. Um, in Node.js, it's uh, basically single-threaded, but it also runs uh, asynchronously um, and then yeah many people when they start uh, tests they might have a certain ramp up time to warm up the system and that's a very important thing because for example the yeah the JVM has a just-in-time compiler and uh, when you run a program only a single time for example you would get that compilation effort um, and then it's slower than after a while when everything is warmed up. Other mm -hmm. things could be caches that are being used that are warmed up. Or um, very simply also the, the workload itself. Like um, obviously if this is a workflow engine is completely empty, then that's a different picture than if you have already a larger number of workflows in the system. And that's apparently tr especially true because uh, you are just starting workflows and not finishing them in, in your benchmark here, so that over time the system would fill up with more data and that could then make things slower. Um, so, but then for now you decided to just have no ramp up time, just start right away with uh, with the benchmark and you're running it, uh, at least that's what I recorded last time, you were running it here for 30 seconds. Yeah, we yeah. See you can run it for whatever amount of time you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I was just really capturing the data from the benchmarks that you have published here. Mm -hmm. um, so then, depending how you design your test, you could limit the number of process instances to start. In your case, you don't do that. You just um, run it for this time. So the time is kind of the limit. Um, also, you don't have a fixed rate at which you start. Um, it's really just pumping in workflows as fast as it can, right? Yes. Yep. As fast as the engine can act them. Yeah. And it brings us to the next point. Um, you, uh, there are different options on how to start. So you could start really asynchronously and don't wait for anything. Um, you could wait for the response of the start. So when you uh, create a process instance, when you send that command, you will receive an acknowledgement when the start has completely, um, yeah, when the start has completed. So for yeah. example, if a broker wants with replication, we would even wait for at least a quorum of replicas to have that uh, start recorded. And only then we would receive the response that the process was started successfully. Um, so that's one uh, way to wait. I denoted this with a couple of letters here. So a dash means there's no waiting at all. An R means uh, we are waiting for the response of the start. And this is exactly what you're doing here. And yet another option would be to wait for the completion of the workflow, which and means start we, another one. Yeah, we don't start another instance until we have completed one. And uh, mm -hmm. That is uh, sometimes what customers do in real life. If they want to uh, 
you know, rate limit a little bit how much is running in parallel, then they might actually wait for this, the completion. And this could also be a way to then measure the cycle time by really running start to end, wait for the end of the workflow, and then recording the cycle time. People really do that, huh, in production? Um, some people do that. That they um, so we have some customers that are more in a in a request response loop with uh, the entire workflow, where for example, yeah, an incoming request is is in the need to run in a complete workflow instance until it can be answered to the outside, and that's really the reason why we have implemented that feature to wait for the completion that, of the workflow. Is that like a single user, single user system? Because wouldn't in, in in, in like most real world scenarios, you've got like N number of like users on the internet connecting to your web server through your web page and then triggering processes that run. I mean, obviously each of those users needs it to run to completion to complete their transaction, but wouldn't there be multiple of those happening at the same time in the workflow engine? Mm -hmm. um, that could still happen. And that for example, could be implemented by then having multiple threads. Right. Uh, a number of load generator threads is typically what is used to simulate user sessions of, you know, actual end users. I see. Um, or of course, if you program that asynchronously, you don't necessarily have to have many threads, um, but you could have some kind of limit of concurrency yeah. of how many parallel requests would be allowed. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. In your case, you kind of rate limit the, the starter by this fact that you are waiting for the response message for the start, and that gives ZB some time to at least you know, process what you are ingesting. Hey, um, Hubert says he has ten thousand IoT fish tank thermometer botnet. <laughs> <laughs> Do some load testing. Great. Yeah, uh, I think. We don't. We might not need those so many bots to to get some good stress testing. Is in especially if you write, write your load generator asynchronously um, in a way that you don't wait at all. Then, um, yeah, a single thread would be enough to really ingest some some high volume in there. Is that even legal? What can you do on a IoT fish tank thermometer? Anyway. It's a lot right there. Epic. Um, Where were okay. we? We were uh, at the yeah at the asynchronicity of the client. We will also see this again with the worker. Um, so we'll talk there again about the asynchronicity. And is there one more thing? Is there something more I can discuss? What's the max payload size? Yeah, the payload size, um, and this is a bit simplifying here, um, but obviously it does matter for performance if you ingest a larger amount of uh, payload data, process variables into the engine. And in, in benchmarks, what we sometimes do is just we, we ingest a, a fairly big or small document at the start. So like maybe, a, for example, a set of variables or maybe even a single JSON variable that contains a big JSON document um, to simulate the impact of that in load testing. Um, obviously, the more data you pump into ZB, the more data has to also then replicate and be written to disk. So this does have an impact. and in order to understand a benchmark result, one also needs to understand if that was done with a lot of data or maybe just with a little data. Um, I guess a typical format, and that's something that's missing here, would be to um, document that in kilobyte. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, how is that in your example? What, how much payload do you ingest when you start the workflow? Do we yeah. see that somewhere in your source code? Yeah, it'll be in uh, lib generator. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let me try to understand your code here. Um, create workflow instance, uh, and that's probably then the empty variable set here, or? Yes, that's, that's it. Okay, so that means payload in your example is zero. So that's another potential thing. Enable um, payload size. Yes, exactly. So you would, in your example, um, you know, have a bit of a faster start because you don't have to store any additional data. And I guess realistic would be to at least have a handful of variables, um, you know, maybe a couple of strings and numbers. What we generally recommend to users is to have only a few variables. Um, you don't, you shouldn't use ZB as the system that stores all your domain data. Um, that's already useful or not so useful because there's, it's hard to query the data out of ZB's engine again, if you need it any later. So the best thing would be to store your domain data in some other storage system, whatever it might be. And then usually that gives you some kind of key or reference that you could use to then identify that data later. And such a reference is a perfect uh, example of what you should put into ZB variables to um, you know, keep the connection. So for example, if you have an order that you're processing, store it in your order database and then um, you know, take the order ID as a parameter that goes into ZB into a process variable. And then each time a worker needs to interact with the order, it could simply read out the order ID out of the ZB variables and then query that order database to get the actual order data into access. And the only real data that ZB would need at any time are uh, things, for example, to decide uh, um, a gateway. Right. So for example, if in my little example here, I would have an exclusive gateway, then I might need some data to decide whether I go um, in any of the, or in which branch I, I should go. And this kind of routing information, this is something that I would need as a variable in, in the process. So that's really what you should have is routing information and references to the data, but not all the data itself. And we also see sometimes counterexamples to that where people just pump entire uh, documents or messages into the engine. Um, this, this can be a style of using ZB, but comes potentially with a performance penalty. Okay. Um, so now we understood the workload generation um, a little bit. Mm. Um, is there anything else that I would need to consider um, for your example? You know, I don't know if, if, if I have, just double checking if I'm complete here. Mm. So let me just check your results again. So we have captured the time that you're running. Um, the version number is obviously part of the ZP configuration. We will talk about that in a second. Um, yeah, and then that's probably a good description of how your load is generated. Um, and maybe I could go screen here, put both on the screen. Do while while. And I haven't used that for since I programmed in Pascal. What are you looking at right now? <clears throat> On line 42. Um, line 42. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And then here we can see the waiting, right? Yes. We are first. Um, waiting for uh, the, the catch here. Or wait, this is just probably with a problem. Um, uh, if that, that's, that, that, that there, error 13 is actually an internal error. 
Mm -hmm. It sometimes throws that. Okay. Actually, what I should do, I can see a bug there because what I'm doing is I'm, I'm saying that it started another one even when it throws an error. So I should actually put that in a then instead. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it waits until start is finished and start uh, create workflow instance. Is that a blocking command in the ZB client? Um. Well, we're awaiting it, so. And that makes it blocking? Yeah. <clears throat> That's like doing a join, send, join. Without await, it's just send. Mm -hmm. OK, got it. So this uh, create workflow instance returns some kind of future object, and then you can wait on it. Exactly, yeah, promise of an eventual result. Mm -hmm. OK, got it. That makes sense. Yeah, and then the loop would just start the next instance uh, as soon as the acknowledgement has come that the other one started. So yes. that means also in, in this setup, um, there's no parallelization of the start itself. It's really just starting one. And only when that is persisted, we will then start the next one. Um, we will have parallel workflow instances that are in flight. But from a processing point of view, ZB will only process one process instance each time because we are waiting here before we start the next one. So this is even probably limiting a little bit the, the throughput. There might be options for, especially if you run with multiple partitions, there might be options to parallelize in ZB, even the start. Yeah, I've actually run into a problem with this where you deploy the workflow process and then you start the generator, but it tries to start the first workflow instance on a partition other than partition one and, and it hasn't replicated yet. Mm, okay. So when you do the deployment, it actually says it's deployed, it gives you a key and everything, but it hasn't necessarily been replicated over the whole cluster. Mm hmm. That's uh, interesting. You not, sorry, not over the whole cluster, but over the whole, all of the partitions or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's only when you do multiple partitions. Yeah. Yeah, there could obviously be a bit of a race condition there. Um, uh, so, yeah, probably you need some, some waiting time in the, in the start before you pump in data. Hmm. Didn't happen to me, but um, yeah. If that happens, one just has to wait a while. So that would also be something to consider for a potential ramp up time, right? Yeah, that's what I was thinking when I saw that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, so a ramp up time is typically a time when also uh, no measurement starts. So you, for example, if you do a throughput measurement, you would mm. first run it for the while without measuring. And then um, after the ramp up time, that's when people would start measuring their, their KPIs to then understand how is the system working after the warm up phase. Okay, now let's look at the engine part of this. And this is by far the largest part of the configuration um, that we need to look at. Um, so in this case, I think I started with your 24.1 test result. We could, of course, also yeah, capture all your test results in the table to then also have a bit of a comparison, right? And I think you also um, did some variations of this already where you've run with different partition setups or stuff like that yeah that's in the zb forum mm -hmm. put um, the results in there would you have a link to that maybe you can open that forum entry as well let me have a look forum zb.io dun 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 mm. garage Huh. Yeah, this is a more fully featured kind of thing. Let me send it to you. Um, how do I send it to you? 
Slack. Yeah, okay. Let me reopen Slack. Oh, <clears throat> everything closed on your side. I closed everything down, yeah. Um, I also had Docker running. So it was running a virtual Ubuntu machine in the background. Here you go. Oh, do I have it maybe right away? <laughs> yeah, my browser already remembered the link. Boom. Okay, I got it. In that case, if you want to spare some some performance, CPU you can use cycles, yeah. Sleep slack closed. So um, yeah, you run it with three partitions and then with two partitions and with one partition. Yeah. So yeah. Let's let's have a look at these different uh, variations and um, see if we can then capture them in this tool. Um, so yeah, first of all, um, the engine ver the engine that is under test is uh, interesting. So obviously we are testing ZB here. Um, I also developed this table in a way that it could be useful for Kamunda BPM or other product, um, or obviously also Kamunda Cloud, which is uh, kind of the product that we are using ZB in. And then for Kamunda Cloud, I uh, just captured here the different t-shirt sizes that are available, um, which could be then going in here. So, but for now, we just put a Z in here to note ZB. Um, the engine version is a very important thing because obviously, depending on what we're changing in, in each version, um, there might be uh, more or less performance. Um, usually the, the last couple of release cycles have been focused on stability and um, yeah, no, bug fixing. And that not necessarily meant that we all, uh, went faster in every release, um, but the, the, the focus is shifting a little bit now as we probably also uh, demonstrate by talking about this topic. Um, we are working on performance optimization and um, will hopefully in the next releases also improve the performance a little bit. Um, so then, very important topic as well is the machine type that is being used. And for the machine types, I even have a um, completely separate uh, table to just really capture exactly what kind of machine is being used. And I think I have that in a separate spreadsheet. Let me open that because there it even comes with a little bit of color. And I think we did that together last time. We captured your uh, MacBook that is um, running these tests or that you published. Um, technically, that is a machine that has eight CPU cores and six, that means uh, 16 hyper threads that can be used for parallel processing. Um, you have 32 gigs of memory and yeah, if we go a little bit into the details, um, the CPU that you have is a Coffee Lake um, microarchitecture from Intel, which means you get um, some 125, uh, 128 kilobytes of level two cache per hyper thread. Um, this cache would be shared by two threads. And then you have one megabyte of L3 cache for each thread and uh, this is a cache that obviously is shared across all cores. So altogether you have 16 megabytes of cache and te like theoretically each thread could have one megabyte if you share it evenly. Um, there could also be a situation where it's not shared evenly, especially if you, for example, run with a single partition, then um, that single partition could use a larger part of the shared L3 cache, for example. Um, and then frequency wise, um, there's a, Three gigahertz base frequency, um, uh, yep, and then you could scale all, all the way up to 4.8 gigahertz with a single core um, that that runs in turbo mode. Uh, whereas if all cores run in turbo, that would only be uh, 4.1 gigahertz per core. Um, so those are interesting um, numbers here because they tell you depending on how much you do on that same CPU or how much parallel work you do, um, each thread would be 
having more resources and could run faster or not so fast, yeah, really depending on the amount of parallelism. So I would even assume, like, uh, if you just run these these tests with a single instance at each time and you're just waiting for the instance to at least have their start done, it could even be beneficial to run with lower number of partitions. And I guess we can review your results later uh, to see if that, that uh, assumption is true. And if you would really max out your system, so for example, with 16 hyper threads, you could in theory run up to 16 partitions in parallel and then still have them running on separate threads on the CPU. Um, but then there might be diminishing returns of the parallelism because uh, at some point the shared resources are yeah, congested. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Sometimes less is more. Indeed. And one interesting observation is that um, those ratios between, um, for example, how much cache is available per CPU hyper thread, that doesn't change even if you look at, uh, at high performance server CPUs. So let's just go for latest Cascade Lake um, Xeon scalable Intel CPUs. This is what you would have uh, like the state of the art data center um, server CPUs. Yes, they would come with more cores and they would also come with more level three cache, but the, the ratio per thread is actually almost the same. Mm. Um, one thing that those server CPUs have is they typically have a larger number of a larger amount of level two cache per hyper thread or per core. Um, so that could mean um, you can actually more run more and stuff in parallel because there's a faster and bigger level two cache that is closer to the thread. Um, but even that is not unlimited. It's going up to 512 kilobytes and kind of what you gain there is lost in level three cache because there it goes down to um, 0.7 um, megabytes, whereas on your Mac, you had a megabyte of um, level three cache per thread. All right. So um, and I think on the server CPUs, those uh, ratios are almost the same. If you take a bigger CPU, it might have more cores, but uh, the cache ratios are almost the same um, for, for all the CPUs that use the same microarchitecture. Mm. All right, enough of that hardware shenanigans. Um, back to the table. So um, I just put an entry here, machine type is Josh Mac, and then in the other table, we have all the details of your hardware. Um, and I would use uh, that in a similar way for typical machine types of uh, cloud machines. So for example, if you run it in Google Cloud or in AWS, um, I would have um, machine types that you can have available there and then record their hardware data. And Sometimes it's actually a bit hard to find that out exactly. Um, so for example, you can see here a column that's a bit funny. It's called a likely CPU model. Based okay. on all the specifications that Google is sharing, I, um, I just estimated or looked up which could be a likely CPU model. Uh, and I think I even put some comments in here. So for example, with the clock ratings that they are uh, advertising, um, there's only really one possible CPU that has this exact clock rate and mm. um, you know, this kind of setup that they are documenting. So it's which is uh, fairly um, possible to understand what hardware you're running on inside the cloud. And uh, the one thing is in the cloud, uh, if you go for smaller machine sizes, for example, if you are uh, asking for a four core eight thread machine type, that would most likely be a physically bigger machine. You can see here, for example, um, a C2 standard eight machine on Google Cloud is physically um, an 18 core CPU that is then chopped off into multiple pieces. Okay, um, so that's really about the hardware part. Um, I guess you can, that the table shows I have been nerding around with that a little bit to really understand the hardware I'm working with. 
Uh, and part that is also because we have done some research in how we use the hardware and we've seen that, for example, the cache is a piece that we are working with and depending how much cache we have and how we're working with it, that could have an impact. Okay. Um, now, from the machine type, we could then, uh, for example, deduct the uh, number of vCPUs that we have available. Um, I did put that as a separate column in here to denote what is actually available to the to the Docker image or the Docker container, right? Because let's say if you are in Kubernetes, you might have physical Kubernetes machines, ah, still VMs, but you might have a Kubernetes node that runs on, let's say, a C2 standard eight, which means Kubernetes node has eight hyper threads available, but then you might decide to as not assign all of them to your container. And that then makes a difference, right? So long story short, the next parameters here are a cluster size. In your case, it's a single node cluster. You just run the Docker image in a single instance. Um, I think you mentioned last time you assigned eight vCPUs to that single container and eight gigabyte, no, six gigabytes of memory, right? Yes, eight, eight CPUs, six uh, gigs of RAM. Where would we see that in your source code? Uh, you don't, that's the Docker configuration on the on the host machine. Ah, okay, so that's kind of a default setup for if you run an image without requests. Uh, no, that's not a that's not a default setup. That's the actual Docker engine configuration on my machine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here, when you uh, run something, you really just um, specify the container version, the container tag, and then the rest is coming from your system parameters. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good to understand. So that might mean uh, if other people are replicating those results, it might depend on their Docker default settings. Yes, it will depend on their Docker settings and obviously their hardware. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. So, yeah, so then that means this is really the amount of hardware that ZB can leverage if it would try to exceed that, then it would be limited by Docker. Um, then another important bit for the performance is uh, the, uh, yeah, if we are using any exporters and the ZB configuration. And maybe that would be good to open the docs a little bit and look at the standard ZB configuration. Um, we have a nice appendix in here where we can see some configuration templates. Um, and I think also in your case, you would be running a standalone broker with an embedded gateway, right? Yes, that's correct. Oh, hang on a second. I think I will use the docs here because they already have syntax highlighting. Um, yeah, so The exporters, that's basically the section at the end of the configuration. Um, here we are, it's a little hard to read. Um, so we have different types of exporters that could, um, you know, lock events into external um, um, storages. Um, there's something like the debug lock or the debug HTTP exporter, which would give you some debugging information. And one of the more common ones is the elastic search exporter, which is used for operate to really record the data of the workflows. And obviously such an exporter is also in the critical loop because all the events that are coming through the system would be written to the exporter. And in this case, that would write it to Elasticsearch. And that is an additional load that the ZB engine would have to handle. Um, so and in your case, you disabled the exporters, which again gives you um, a bit more of an edge on the throughput, because that's not some extra work that needs to be done. Um, and then I think I 
already defined a little bit of a list of uh, possible values here. So there's a metrics exporter that can be enabled, uh, the elastic exporter, obviously. Um, then debug would be debug lock. Um, latency, that's an exporter that I've written uh, a while ago um, that gives you an, a feeling for event and command latency in, in inside the engine. Um, yeah, these kind of things can could be used in here. Oh. Josh, are you having a look on the comments, by the way? I see there's some discussion going on. Yeah, Hugh Board's just saying that there was some lag spots. So I was just trying to kill some uh, processes to see if that makes oh, it any okay. better. Was there lag in the uh, in the screen or um, also in the audio? Um, well, the thing is that I can hear you fine. Mm -hmm. Everything's looking fine on the screen here. So I'd say it would be the upload from... I guess from my machine back out to Twitch. Mm, okay. Yeah. Because my local experience of it in the browser is uh, pretty good. Okay. Great. So then what else could be interesting to look at? Um, well, we've already talked a little bit about resources. And I guess now that I see this, it would be good to rearrange those columns a little bit. Um, and make sure, you know what, let me do this right away. There are so many variables involved, aren't there? It's just crazy. People are like, oh, yeah. I can't get, you know, how many, how many, uh, how many processes can ZB start per second? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Let's talk. <laughs> Let's get started. So... Yeah, what is uh, the what are these guys about CPU threads and I/O threads? So this is then um, you know ZB is using threads in Java to uh, do the processing work. Um, those threads are heavily reused for different tasks inside the engine, and yeah, depending on the resources you have available, you might want to then also assign a huge or at the right number of threads so the resources can actually be used. And this is something that we already discovered last time. And in, in the default configuration, we would have two CPU threads and two IO threads. Or was that something you changed? I um, don't remember exactly. But I guess if we look here, yeah, those are the default settings, right? Um, two and two. So if you just get a ZB out of the box. And I think I documented this here in an extra line, default value for IO threads and CPU threads is two and two. Um, now you said your Docker would have eight hyper threads, eight vCPUs available. Yes. Uh, so that means, and maybe let's be very precise here, right? Uh, I think I mentioned it more, I touched this topic. Um, if we go back to the machine types, if you look at a modern CPU, then a modern, uh, then we would typically have multi-core CPUs, um, and each of the cores. So this die image here, I think that's a Haswell core, or the Haswell um, CPU um, shot. Mm. This one has eight cores, and each core itself would have two so-called hyper threads. And those are really the elements that are counted, for example, also by the cloud providers um, that as, as the so-called vCPUs. Um, and physically, um, yeah, a core can run two logical threads of the operating system. So also on such a CPU, you would have uh, the operating system report um, uh, eight, no, uh, 16 processors altogether because uh, 16 threads could run in parallel in the CPU. Of course, there might be some of the shared resources like the level two cache in the core uh, or the level one cache that, yeah, those logical um, threads have to share and have to live with. Um, but yeah, depending on how much data they use, they might actually be able to really process in parallel. Okay. So that's important to understand about these numbers. vCPUs are not cores, they are hyper threads. And um, yeah, now looking at our Java threads, 
that ZB is configuring, we saw here that we only have two CPU threads. That means out of the hyper threads that Docker provides to ZB, it would only leverage two of them. And maybe two in addition um, for any IO work, but since IO work is usually not CPU intensive, I mean, the name suggests it already, right? IO is uh, meaning you're writing to disk. And IO work is usually more uh, bound by other parameters. So it doesn't use the CPU a lot. So mm. a typical setup that I would do is um, I would take all the vCPUs that I have available for my Docker container and assign them as um, CPU threads. And this is what I suggested to you already last time when we talked, um, we should probably adjust the configuration in your setup to use eight CPU threads so that you could leverage the hardware that is available. Mm. And um, I have developed a little bit of a notation here. Um, that's so right. So that's okay. That that's a, that's an actual ZB configuration, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. So if we look at the documentation again, um, we have this um, CPU thread count and IO thread count. Those are the parameters. Um, might make sense to document this. Oh no, I actually did document this here. These are the command line parameters or in the configuration, it's called CPU thread count. And are there environment variables for those? Yeah, you see it on my screen. Oh, yeah. And this would also be mentioned in the documentation here, right? Um, CB broker threat CPU count. Um, yeah, environment variables is probably what you can use to configure that in your benchmark, right? Yeah, that's how I do it. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, in that case, yeah, you know, doing it via, um, what are those things called? Um, command line switches is kind of cool and everything, but now you're starting to get too many of them. You know, you want to have like a JSON object or something. Mm -hmm. Like a test spec dot JSON. Yeah, or maybe provide a ZB configuration file that you just pump in, that you mount into the Docker image. There might be some uh, uh, version dependency here, um, especially since version 23, when we changed to the Spring Boot configuration syntax. Yeah. So this might be making it a bit challenging if you want to go all the way back to version 22 or earlier. Mm. On the other end, it's a bit of a moving target anyway, because uh, version 22 will go out of support soon. Or did it already go out of support, I think? How was it? We support three versions back, right? So 25 will come out soon. And then um, 25, 24, 23 will be the supported ones, if I remember correctly. Okay. Um, so then maybe that could be sufficient. Um, yeah, and uh, I wanted to describe very quickly how I uh, work with this notation here. So a line in here that is colored in red would denote a test that is planned but not yet executed. Uh, so this is something when we chatted, when we had a quick chat last time, um, that's kind of when I when we had the idea to do the session today, um, I suggested, hey, let's do a test where we increase the CPU threads and then ZB can actually use your CPU much better and leverage the hardware. Yes. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, what I also developed is the idea that when I change a parameter, and if you do if you do different benchmarks, you should usually just change one parameter at a time so that you really understand which parameter has what influence on your workload. And in this case, we could run that same test again, just uh, change the um, CPU thread configuration, and then we could directly measure what has this changed as an impact. Okay. Um, I can probably just whack that into the code now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you are eager to try that out. And you can see here the parameter that has changed. I marked it with a bit of a background color and also a bold text. So it's more easy to spot this in a larger result table um, 
what changes have been done and what impact did they have. So uh, what else do we have? Uh, then we already have the number of partitions that ZB is using. By default, uh, we would run with a single partition. And in your test setup, you have tried one, two, and three partitions. Yes. And I think where we came to it is when you work with three partitions, that's really the moment when you will hit that CPU uh, three CPU thread bottleneck. Because with three partitions, um, where they would then have to compete for the CPU threads. Yeah. And I think there's even rumors that uh, it could be beneficial to have even two threads per partition. So that me could even mean, even with uh, two partitions that you already hit bound uh, bottlenecks because you don't have uh, enough CPU threads available. You would have them physically from Docker, but you don't have them in ZB because um, ZB doesn't use enough Java threads to leverage them. CPU oh. threads, okay. Um, yeah, then obviously the replication factor is another interesting uh, parameter. This would uh, work especially in a multi-cluster setup. In your case, you have a single ZB node, so replication doesn't make sense. Um, but for more production-like environments, people would work with replication. And uh, we even have seen some setups where replication was having a, a positive influence on performance. Um, really? Yeah. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but it must it's have very. Been. It's very counterintuitive. How does replication, how does having to replicate things over a distributed network system speed it up? Tell me. <laughs> Come on. Um, I, my assumption is that it has some, um, it, it, diff it, it changes the way how we access certain data and that could have an impact on, I don't know, for example, uh, different caches and how they are used. So that the, they use the, the data or patterns at change and they, they become beneficial. Yeah, um, so but in general, general, I agree. I, um, I get it. You, what you just said was magic. <laughs> <laughs> that's very counterintuitive i can't understand how that could happen that's 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 what do they say it's like all scientific discovery begins with like inexplicable experimental results right yeah my explanation would have more along the lines as it's complicated you know zb is itself a distributed system and uh you know, it uses many components of uh, of the machines that it's running on. You know, we are kind of also our own database. And um, that means replication and also the, the commits that we are doing have a direct dependency on all the underlying um, disk storage, for example. And to give people the guarantees that they want that, uh, you know, whenever we did something in a workflow, we will never forget about it. And we will make sure that we replicate that and store it on disk. And yeah, if you have a change in the pattern, what you're doing, it might be just that you hit a sweet spot in terms of caching um, that would then allow you to even be a little bit faster with that access pattern. But the details are yet to be understood correctly. So that's probably the aspect where it's right now still magic. That's um, kind of cool because this is an example of something that you discovered through actual exploration, right? Empirically testing the stuff. Nobody would think that. That's true. Yeah. It came as a little, as a little bit of a surprise um, when we did different variations of testing. Could be cosmic rays. Maybe did you, re did you, did you reproduce it? We could reproduce it, yeah. So not, not cosmic rays then. No. And I guess it also looks at, uh, it depends on what you're looking. In this particular uh, case, I was talking about uh, throughput time, not necessarily uh, about uh, starting. Starting and uh, also like the, the round trip time, that's the right term. So throughput would definitely decrease if you work with replication um, because we have to simply do more shuffling of data and uh, the nodes are more busy with keeping care of the taking care of the replicas as well um, but it can have a beneficial impact on the cycle time of a workflow um, although i think there was also something a bit th throughput so 
Yeah. That would be exactly something to play around with. Uh, result, they record the results and then see when you exactly change that one replication factor parameter to see how that has an impact. And really understanding that in detail would then mean to also look a lot at uh, all the more underlying hardware metrics that can be measured. Okay, well, let's see if we can uh, make it through that table uh, without going into too much X courses all the time. Um, another parameter is the message size of ZB. This would be the limit of um, how big could, for example, variable payload grow. By default, this would be four megabytes. And we have seen that um, in the current versions, uh, reducing this parameter can have um, a good impact on performance as well. And that has, on the one hand, an S, uh, a relation with I.O. that we do on disk, but it also is something uh, related to the cache usage of the CPU. Um, similar to is the log segment size. So this is the size of um, how much we would write into one log file segment. Um, that's also related a lot to the disk I.O. that we are doing. And yeah, could be something that that is modified. Um, another one is the snapshot duration. Um, by default, ZB does this every 15 minutes. We take a snapshot of the state of the RocksDB database and then write that to disk separately. And whenever we do a, a snapshot, that means we can erase data from the log streams. And uh, this is a good thing. And we have seen that using a shorter interval here, like for example, just one minute, oh, would hey. be also helpful. Oh yeah, I see the request. Let me see if I go to 125%. Would that be better? And I might also go into full screen mode here to just use the real estate we have. Yeah, to answer that question, um, I mean, it's not the main idea of ZB to do benchmarking, but um, if you want to run ZB under load and, um, you know, have a hard throughput limit that you need to reach or um, a cycle time limit, then, yeah, doing benchmarks is a really important step and it should be done uh, early in your project, not late, because if you find out late that you have problems, it might be too late to adjust your application design or also, yeah, you might end, you might end up throwing a lot of hardware on the problem. Or maybe to even find out that, um, you know, your workflow, your workload is uh, not what ZB can serve at the moment. So yeah, really encourage people to do load testing early and really also understand all the parameters of their system and how they configured it. And then obviously people can contact us to um, get help with this tuning and see which parameters could be adjusted to work better for their workloads. Yeah, and I mean, basically you can, this is like a scientific approach to performance benchmarking measurement. It's like, you know, how do we make it faster? Put it on a bigger machine. You know, that's often the only thing that you, that you can think of, right? But like, you can actually drill down a lot deeper into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Hugh Board says, I'm a degenerate PHP developer, so I've never cared about this type of stuff before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, I used to be a PHP guy as well in my early days. Um, Respect. And Kind of when I joined Kamunda, I kind of converted to Java and stayed there. Um, would be cool to once pro program a PHP client for ZB. I think someone started one. Oh, really? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. PHP is a nice programming language um, if you use it the right way. It's unfortunately, a, especially. I, I thought you were going to say if you're a maniac. <laughs> No, no, no. I think the reputation is worse than, than the language. Um, I guess the, the fact is really just PHP 
has been used or was used a lot by by uh, you know let's say System programmers that self-taught and not necessarily had a computer science or software engineering degree and um, also the language in the in its early days made it kind of easy to write bad code and or you know code that maybe had an either performance problems or security problems or um, it was just hard to maintain. So in okay. that sense, it delayed JavaScript. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, there's this book, uh, JavaScript, uh, the good parts, right? Where you did kind mm -hmm. of take the good parts out of the language. And if you do that with PHP, um, you get some quite decent programming there as well. So, for example, I used to use PHP in a mode more like you would program Java, like you know, fully object oriented and with good encapsulation of of stuff and loose coupling between different components. And you know, mm. it can be quite decent language to work with. Um, all right, um, that's regarding the programming language uh, flame wars. Um, I added the CPU and uh, IO thread count configuration mm -hmm. to the uh to the tester cool it's it's untested yeah. but it should work first time you know that's how i code <laughs> <laughs> yep so uh let's move on with the configs here uh memory map files this is something that we're currently working on and in, in getting that um in a, in a stable way. It is kind of an undocumented feature right now. Uh, it's already available as a configuration switch that you could change. Um, it doesn't work with replication at the moment. So in, in your case, with the way you're running with replication factor one, you might even give that a try and um, see how that improves the performance. But Memory mapped files, is that like a RAM disk? Um, not exactly. Uh, it's a file that is physically stored on disk, but um, the reading and writing to that file is handled by the operating system. So um, it's basically mem uh, using a portion of that file and maps that into main memory and into uh, cache then ultimately. Swap and that. the operating system would then um, try to estimate based on your usage of the file or what part of it it's currently mapping into memory. So for example, if you're sequentially reading through a file, um, as we do, right, we are writing lock screens and we're reading them, um, the operating system might understand that we are just moving you know, or only touching a certain part of the file and exactly that part will then be in memory. And um, yeah, that gives um, potentially a better IO and, and cache usage. Um, yeah, where did, where, where did there, you they, um, there's a parameter there. Let me see if we have that already in the configuration here. Um, no, I think it's not documented. It's, uh, uh, do I have that somewhere? Is this no, like an it's... undocumented? Super hack. It's an undocumented configuration parameter. Yeah. Really? Okay. Um, yeah, as is. I said, this uh, since it is undocumented now, I would advertise uh, not to use it right now. But it will come quite soon that this is uh, something that's enabled. Maybe it will even be enabled in, in, as a default in future, and okay. that would make a difference. Um, of course, if you do any kind of undocumented or any configuration change in that area that should definitely go in such a spreadsheet and uh, i have it here because we have run some internal testing where we already played with that um yeah then uh, another important aspect is uh, since we already talk about io um, what disk are you using and what disk type um, so one important thing would be to definitely use SSDs as a storage. And I would hope in your case, this is an SSD as well on your Mac. Yeah, yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely is. 
Um, that's good. So that would be our uh, minimum requirement because we are our own data storage system. So we need disk storage and we need it fast. And uh, then the disk size, this is not so relevant on a local computer. Um, it's more relevant in the cloud. For example, in Google Cloud, you, are, uh, you will get a uh, disk I.O. throughput and uh, IOPS per second that is linear to the size of disk you are requesting. If you, for example, only request a 10 gigabyte disk volume, you will be limited in the amount of I.O. operations that you can do per second and how much throughput you can do. And uh, for example, in GCP, we typically work with 128 gigabyte disks to have at least some guarantee that, the, that, that this is not the bottleneck. Mm. You run tests in cloud environments, bigger, bigger disks than what you actually need for your storage in ZB. Okay. So in your case, just for completeness, what would be the disk size? Um, unbounded, I think. Um, yeah, and what, was it, what is it physically? Just to be, I guess it's but, not really. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, it's like, I got like, I don't know, 200 gigs free or something. Uh, that would be uh, f not the free memory, but the, the physical size of the disk. Uh, well, it's like a terabyte disk in the machine that is like 268 left for it to use. Yeah, it's not really about the free space. So for example, mm -hmm. uh, if we go um, to, in, in Docker, this would be the volume size that docker is using so maybe there is a limit in your docker configuration again of how this is uh, limited but i think oh no this is fine maybe it's the container no no i think it just grows just keeps growing it mm -hmm. or maybe not i got no idea i'm making it up okay. i'm guessing I'm not going to start Docker to find out either because otherwise my machine will crash. Yeah, that's fine. Oops, sorry. I... Yeah. There we are. So then the next important uh, thing for performance is the back pressure algorithm. ZB has built in um, back pressure mechanism and uh, especially when you load test, you might end up in a situation where you are getting back pressure from ZB and you might also need to configure it in a way that it's correctly adjusted for your load. But this is even worth another uh, a completely new session to discuss back pressure and how it can be configured and what other parameters. Um, I think there's a fairly good section in the documentation that explains the different mechanics that are available. And uh, your tests, if I remember correctly, um, you had back pressure disabled completely. No, you can, it's configurable. Uh, but the results so, that you reported were with back pressure disabled, if I see that here. Yes, yeah. Which is okay for now, because that means you don't have any artificial limits there. Then let me put a dash in here to denote that that was just turn off. And I guess the other ones here are irrelevant then as well. Um, these um, parameters here, um, RTT tolerance and these limits, those are parameters that tune the selected back pressure algorithm. Okay, then um, database, uh, this is basically what's used for the metric storage. Uh, in, in your case, you didn't use a database, so we can just, like you didn't use the elastic search exporter, we can just cross that out. It doesn't look like you can do back pressure via environment variables. You cannot. D. Um. Oh, yes, you can. You can? Here you see back pressure algorithm, back pressure, oh, I see. Limit, max limit. 
So it actually more parameters than I have currently in the spreadsheet. Um, I mean, probably the final version of the spreadsheet will just contain all parameters that are in this file, unless they are just really not relevant for performance. But yeah. for the um, back pressure is definitely relevant for performance. And um, is this also something that's can be tricky to tune because every workload is slightly different and then you have to adjust for your workload. Yeah, and by the time we got to that, I added two more command line switches, minus C for CPU threads and minus I for IO threads. Mm -hmm. I'm not adding all those back pressure things. I'm definitely moving to a, con a test spec file. Yeah. And then it, because there's like branching, you know, options that are available with other, op with different algorithms there. So when you select a specific algorithm, there are configurations for the algorithm. Yes. That don't apply for the other ones. At that point, you definitely have to just have them type it into a file, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, each per each algorithm might have uh, different settings that are applicable. And I think so far I have only captured the ones that are for Vegas and for Gradient. And I think for Vegas, I'm not even complete. I'm still lacking the alpha and beta. Um, so the assumption is basically if it doesn't show up in the table, then it would be using the default parameters. Okay. Um, but man, by the time you get down to this, it's like, you know, which ones do we, you know, this is like, uh, you know, that, that plane that crashed, that Boeing plane, the 737 MAX or whatever it was? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, they changed something in it and then they like changed the, uh, you know, the software so that it automatically compensates for something else. And then people are flying and it just starts behaving unpredictably. This reminds me of that, you know, it's like, which one of these things do I change? Yeah. How, like this back pressure algorithm one, that's, this is a complete dark art to me. I'm like, turn it on, turn it off and see if it works. At, at what point do you go? this is the thing that I should be looking at. Do you have to exhaustively roll down all of those other config parameters that we've looked at until you go, this is the ultimate one. And then you drill into the back pressures to see if you can tune it. Or do you have to do that for everything? Cause like that unexpected result that you achieved where you, where replication actually made it go faster, that one of your poorly performing configurations actually turns into like the stellar winner with the right, back pressure algorithm with the right tuning. I mean, how many tests do you have to run? All of them. Yeah, that, is, um, that is a good question. And unfortunately, the answer is, if you want to understand the influences of your different parameters, you might need to run a lot. So uh, this definitely speaks towards um, automating the testing in, in a similar way how you did it, right? That you can test different configurations and compare them. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the two of us have actually worked on a on a on a hack days project to to really be able to run many different configurations. There are also tools out there like Akamas, for example, that can help in automating and exploring um, the configuration space. And this is true not only for ZB, this is true for many applications nowadays, um, that there are there's an explosion of configuration parameters and each parameter could potentially have an impact on the performance or even if you don't care too much for the performance, it could simply be a cost impact, right? You, mm. Even if you don't have a high throughput system, you might still be worrying about how cheap can I run something, right? How 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 little could my, my system footprint be, in order to um, just get the the workload process that I that I need to run. So I think this is something that pretty much every project has to look at. Maybe some more than others. If you are having a fairly small workload and you are having, let's say, high value workflows that are running on them, like each workflow gives you a good amount of money, then you might not care too much how much hardware you need. A um, couple of uh, servers might still be uh, okay to pay for. Um, but if you go into the high throughput scenarios, then obviously uh, it matters a lot whether I need a huge cluster or maybe a smaller cluster. You know, what you could do is you'd set this thing up where it's like, you know, you're running on Google, for example, 
you're running your workload in a particular configuration and you know you got things like variable throughput depending on like the time of the year all that kind of jazz right number of customers you have that increases over time that kind of stuff and so you have like the metrics coming out of your system then you have another system that uses the google api to like you know they release a new class of vm or whatever and it's just continually running your actual current workflow across all those different permutations like non-stop and then it just you know you know, your number of customers goes up and it, and it goes, hey, you know what? This is going to run faster and cheaper on this other thing. And then it just migrates your entire system and reconfigures it on the fly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, would obviously be um, interesting. And Akamas is a tool that goes in, this in, in, in such a direction that it tries to, you know, run tests and then also automatically evaluate the results and find the best possible configuration. And the reason why you sometimes have to run many tests is also that you might sometimes just hit a local optimum, whereas, you know, some other configuration might perform even better, but you didn't expect it. Like, for example, the one with replication, right? That kind of was a bit unexpected. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, for some reason, you, you might hit a sweet spot in how certain caches and pipelines work with uh, with each other. And then that that makes it just a better config. Um, nevertheless, it's not it doesn't have to be completely in the dark. Like you, you don't have to just randomly play with mm -hmm. parameters. There are obviously metrics that you can use to analyze. So remember, um, ZB ships with Grafana dashboards, Grafana monitoring. Um, so those can be used to metric. see what's going on. And uh, for back pressure, for example, first of the first thing you see are the exceptions in a, in a client, right? If you have resource exhaustion uh, exceptions, then you know that back pressure kicks in. And uh, the, the Grafana dashboard of ZB would show you um, how the queue sizes have developed and what, what type of back pressure you're experiencing. And from there, you could then think about what the right tuning parameters could be. And uh, at least the documentation describes a little bit how these algorithms, uh, what their properties are. Like, um, you know, depending on what are you, what your goals are, you could, um, for example, uh, aim for a fixed round trip time or uh, have a certain gradient of configuration. So each algorithm has different properties that it can can guarantee. And yeah, the but... three parameters then also control how fast it reacts to changes of your workload. Yeah. And this hey, uh... is by the way, another one uh, where the ramp up time measure matters. Um, if you have back pressure enabled, you would want to run the system with a certain ramp up time to warm up the back pressure algorithm and then start measuring a more constant load. Right on. Hey, um, how about we wrap it up here then? That seems like a, a good point to uh, checkpoint today's discussion. Um, if it's okay for you, I would spend maybe a couple of minutes of time just to look at the job worker part. I think yeah. by now we should understand this fairly easily. And then obviously the rest of the tables really just result reports and um, yeah, that's then where data can be entered. Yeah, okay, uh, let's do that. And let's um let's aim for like two hours total time then. Yeah. How's that sound? I think that's so about we're, what we're at 141 now. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um yeah, regarding the job worker, I mean it's kind of similar to the client that you had at the beginning. Um a job worker is using usually a ZB client library, and uh then uh, would execute the jobs. And well, technically for your benchmark, we would already be finished because you don't have a job worker. Well, I have the other version. You could copy those two lines. Okay. And and then um, actually, what's the difference between those two lines? They look the same. Well, you can see the highlighting here. Um, the idea oh. was that, uh, again, a red line is a test that we have discussed. We planned it. Um, mm would still need to execute it in order to get results. Okay. And the marking here in blue um, 
marks the single parameter that we switched for that configuration um, that we were interested in exploring the impact of. Mm. So, and you say, have you already run tests with uh, a job worker or was the, would this be yet another test that is? It's just another one. Okay. Yeah. Then let's do that here, right? So I would just copy everything that's there already. Um, I guess here we would have your initial tests. Everything is just nada, nothing. nothing. I think these ones were new plums. That's why they don't show up. And now we could say, yep, we keep this parameter the same. But now on the worker side, we would want to probably have a node based worker. Um, or, yeah, you correct me if I'm wrong, right? Um, I guess a single worker might be a good starting point. One, one thread. Again, for the workers, it would be important uh, how much um, hardware is available. So this is not the threading model inside Node, but rather what physical hardware is available. Uh, well, with this thing here, no, uh, JavaScript single threaded, but the way I created this is that the worker actually runs in a separate thread. So it spawns a sub thread, a sub process. Mm -hmm. And then your Docker limits would be the same as for ZB, um, eight and six? Yes. Okay, that's fine. Um, and for the worker, it's really relevant because the workers are doing a lot of work. The starter is usually a component that uses little resources and just bashes the system with IO throughput. Um, but the workers, they might be CPU intensive. So that's where it's important to really record the, the okay. hardware available to the worker. You know, what's cool about this is I just re I just rewrote the uh, node worker mm -hmm. based on our investigation into uh, Go and Java to uh -huh. work the same way. <laughs> yeah. So it does have a determin deterministic polling window now. Okay. Which is also 100 millisecond by default. Uh, I think I set it to 300 milliseconds by default. Okay, that's interesting. So that brings me in conflict with my defaults here. Because, Those are 100, are they? Um, I guess then my default is for the Java client. Well, I haven't pushed the changes yet, so I can change it to 100, easy. I think it might be good to, to keep that. Okay. But, uh, the same between the clients. Um, 300, that is also asking for a lot of delay for for times when there's nothing going on. So then what else? Uh, there is a request timeout. Um, by default in Java, this would be 20 seconds. I can actually use the defaults here. And then uh, we have two interesting ones here. Um, so in a job worker, you know, there's there's two interesting parts. You first, when you receive a job, you have to maybe do some work. For example, do a REST call to another system or do some CPU work. And whatever you do, it will take some time. And um, you could do this in a blocking way. That means, like, for example, if you have a single thread, you might decide to just synchronously do your job work. And that means then you wouldn't do any other jobs in parallel. And if you do this in a non-blocking way, this gives the system a chance to parallelize as much as possible. In Node.js, I would assume that maybe you were doing the work asynchronously. Is that right? Yes. OK. And then there's another interesting bit, which is the job completion. Um, from a client point of view, it's just uh, the complete command that completes the job. But this will take some time in ZB to be processed. And therefore, it's also um, I.O. intensive, meaning we wait for a network I.O. We wait until ZB is um, back with the processing. And ideally, this is also done in a non-blocking way so that we don't block our single thread in Node.js um, with the wait for that job completion. Um, I assume that's a yes. Um, yeah. Um, uh, so it requests all of the work and then it works on it. Yeah, uh, non-blocking. No, it doesn't wait for it. No, it just says so, sends off the request. Yeah. To, remember to how we looked at your starter? Um, yeah, have, have, have the worker. 
So where was it? Um, That's it there, line 44. Exactly. Hmm. Did this just change? <laughs> yeah, I, I refactored it. Interesting. That's uh, <laughs> yeah. faster than I expected. Exactly. So here we would have a an active waiting for the for the creation of the workflow yeah. until we do the next one, right? So this really blocks until uh, this is started. Um, and complete works the same way. We get an acknowledgement from ZB once the job completion has fully completed and is committed on disk. And that's important because as long as we don't have this commit, the worker is responsible for telling ZB that this thing has, has done, has, has completed. Uh, and this could, in theory, fail. Um, we do. It wouldn't fail because of back pressure, because those job completions are whitelisted. They don't receive back pressure. Mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, there could be some problem. We lose connectivity or something like that. And the broker uh, dies. Well, if the broker yeah. dies, you agree. Yeah. No, but let's say I don't know. The gateway died, and we lose network connection between the worker and the and ZB. Um, in that case, the worker is responsible for retrying, for example. And um, yeah. This is something to be aware of. And of course, I could program this in a synchronous way where I'm blocking, um, but ideally the completion could be done asynchronously. Have a look at the, if you go back up one level from there, there's the worker code is there. Oh yeah, true. Get it. Um, so we have create worker, then we have a task handler. Oh, this is so cool for JavaScript. It understands. Um, Syntax highlighting. Complete success then. Completed. Yeah. And it understands what this is. Wow. Um, Amazing. Yeah, so it doesn't it doesn't uh, it doesn't await it. It's all fully asynchronous. Yeah, right. So we just have a callback lambda here um, that will be invoked. Max when. job to activate one. <laughs> Where was that? 21, just right there. Yeah. OK, I mean, this is a bit conservative. Um, but as soon, I mean, if you are doing it asynchronously in the, if you're doing the work asynchronously, this would then. I have to see how it changes it. Because when it was set to anything more than one, it was hosing the broker. It was just, you know. Because it would ask, it would ask for one job. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, it would ask for two jobs. One would be available. It would get that one. It would immediately ask for another one because that polling interval acts like a buffer. Mm -hmm. And so, without that polling interval in there, ask uh, setting max jobs to anything more than one caused like a, de a denial of service attack on the broker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this brings me to another configuration parameter. Um, where are we? Max jobs active. Um, so do you have any limitation in the Node.js client? How many jobs can be active at a certain time? Yeah, max int. Max int? <laughs> yeah. I would call that a little aggressive. <laughs> well, I just mean to say that I didn't program any boundaries on it. So whatever you, number you can represent mm -hmm. in the... Uh, I guess it would be whatever number you can represent in the gRPC protocol call, right? For jobs to activate, mm -hmm. max jobs to activate. Okay, so yeah, this would probably be fairly big in your case. Um, I mean, if you have a single worker, it doesn't play any difference. Um, it does make a difference when you are having multiple worker instances, multiple replicas, because then being too aggressive on a single worker means the other ones could starve out. Mm. If there's a bad timing between the pollings, maybe you know there's a peak coming into the system, one job, uh, job worker seizes, gets all the jobs, but is obviously not capable of uh, completing them all in time. And whereas other workers would have more capacity left, but they just don't get the jobs. Right. I would suggest maybe to start with the default, which is 32. And um, then go from there. This was the default from the Java client. So 
based on my uh, usual syntax, I would now highlight these as the parameters that have changed. Um, so we would kind of schedule two tests now, one where you uh, increase the number of CPU threads, and then one where you actually have workers Then, um, yeah, on the to just quickly touch on the result um, capturing um, everything that was here in the blue columns. This is configuration. With that, we hopefully have a complete coverage of all the relevant parameters that would uh, describe such a load test. And then you have, uh, yeah, different output columns here for the throughput. Um, throughput could be measured in the number of completed workflows per second and the number of completed flow nodes, so BPMN elements per second. It's just different scales. FNI per second has the advantage that it is independent of the workflow model. It's kind of a normalized value. And in your case, it will probably be the more interesting one to look at because you're not completing the workflow. Mm. Um, so FNI throughput is kind of the only thing you can measure with a start. And then um, uh, you have the workflow instance duration. Again, not really measurable in your example because you don't complete the workflow. Um, for that, you could also have a standard deviation. Um, and I think we have the same as flow node duration and the test duration. Test duration is easy in your case because you have a fixed duration limit. So this column is basically just taking the value from the start here, right? Mm. You have your duration and that defected. Um, and then one could further dig into, uh, into cost metrics. For example, I think those formulas, uh, no, I don't have the formula here right now. Um, yeah, you can easily compute then uh, how much dues to, did you have overall in your cluster? how many vCPUs, how much memory, typically focused on the ZB side of things, not so much on the workers. Um, and then you could compute uh, also on top of that, for example, what was your workflows per second per CPU, per memory, and also you could nail it down to service calls that have been made. In your case, it's those metrics are a little bit weak because you didn't complete the workflow. So computing those might be a little misleading because then the numbers would look pretty good, whereas <laughs> technically <laughs> doing skipped. nothing. Yeah. So yeah. it would be cool if you do the worker then to maybe measure those those numbers. Hmm. Okay. And uh, then uh, I have more than metrics from the hardware utilization of uh, engine and database some more uh, duration details, like looking at the distribution of the workflow duration with uh, minimum, maximum, and some percentiles. Uh, running number of instances. I guess in your case, that would be the end of the work of the test when you had the maximum number. Uh, I think maybe that should be not. That's the total. Total instances that ran? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I'm not sure did you report that in your results? <clears throat> yep. Yeah, right. So in your case, it would be then like yeah. 359 in this example. Should we try at least complete the row uh, of this one test for version yeah, yeah, 4.1 to see one yeah. result in here? So 24.1 with two partitions. Uh, you know what? Let me just open this in a separate tab. On my second screen, and then I will just easily copy paste the data over. Epic. So what is this? Three partitions, two partitions. Here we are, 24.1. Um, 
back pressure was disabled. Well, we captured that already. So after 25 seconds, uh, and it's interesting, you only have a report for the 25 second mark. Um, this didn't seem that you wrote a grand total after all. So we come back to this again. Um, maybe I need to set my timer to plus one second. Let's have a look. Program time times 1000. Okay, your program, so I should go plus one. But, uh, yeah. All right, so I see the result here. <clears throat> what are we looking at? Plus two seconds. Two partitions. Uh, so, I mean, I could use this data now. It's maybe a little bit lower than what's real, but or if you could quickly run it again to give me the final measures, that would also be... Uh, it would be easier for you to do that because I haven't got Docker running. Yeah, got it. Um, yeah, why not? Let's try this. Let's grab a shell. Um, Yep, Docker is up and running. Um, so this was CB Carriage Block. Not yet. Maybe you need to clone it. Yep, looks like it. Um, just grab the URL. You might have to clone it over HTTPS. Why? There we go. Okay. Maybe not. All right, what, I, what would I have to do to get this running? Maybe the readme tells me, right? Um, you would hope so. Mm -hmm. Install dependencies. So did I need, do I need to do both? Yeah, okay, well, this is a global dependency, I guess. Yeah. No. Oh, it's blindly follow your instructions. <laughs> Sending your key, your SSH key to. Uh, this doesn't look healthy. You gotta, you'll have to sudo that. Makes sense. Which, which distro are you running? Uh, Ubuntu, like Ubuntu with KDE. Yeah. And then you got to run NPMI. You don't have to sudo that one. Yeah, that will be the local install, right? Yeah, install the dependencies. Okay. Um, does that look about healthy? Yeah, that's right. Okay, and now I guess I need to, oops, sorry. That was not what I wanted. Too many desktops. Um, now I would need to run the TS node tests. Yeah. With uh, 30 seconds. And disabled, and disabled. Um... Uh, disabled back pressure was the one. Yeah. And I think 30 seconds is fine just to get a feel of it. And I will just focus on one version for now. This, right? Yep. Okay. Let's do it. See what happens. Only fetching images now yeah if you don't have it already locally it will be mm. uh, I should put something in to report about that 
Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, I see network traffic going. Okay. Okay. You know what? Let's let that run for a while, and we could have a look. Oh no, that's already. That's that problem that I was saying. What's that problem? But that's with one partition. It's trying. It's trying to. Um, if you control C out of there. And, um, yeah. It's. Good. it's I think that what it's doing is it's trying to start a workflow instance, but one that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. hmm. What a pity. And if uh, I control C out of this, is this now still running the... It might have a hung container, yeah. I see that here. Okay. If you, if, you, if you docker RM that container and then run it again, it should work. If I what? If you if you delete that container. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you might have to docker stop and then docker rm. Use the force. Now I reckon if you run it again, it'll be really fast and it will work 100%. All right, let's try that. Taco Maniac four 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 has a question. I don't know what it is though. Man, it still doesn't work. Unbelievable. How useful is that error message back from ZB? Hey, expected to execute a command, but this command refers to an element that doesn't exist. Yeah. That sounds a little bit like, yeah, process might have not been deployed. So what can I do to, to fix this? Um, any any chance to do a quick sleep after the deployment before we start? Yeah, that could do it. Let me just do, do, do that. So in test, we're going to test here. Uh, uh, we get the container starting, start the container, and then start the generator. So it's in the generator code. In the generator. Async start await. Deploy workflow. Are you by any chance doing the deployment asynchronously and not synchronously? No. Like wait for the um, confirmation of the redeployment? Now, if you go into generator.ts, mm -hmm. deploy workflow, await. Oh, mm. But then, so would this mean that this is blocking? Yeah, it is. The start method would block here until that's done, and then we continue. Should we see that workflow deployed message? No, look at it. It's not even showing that message. <clears throat> Could there be a problem with the file itself, or where is that coming from? This is hmm, we don't even see where it's coming from what about in the broker in the broker log oh uh, yeah that could be an option Uh, how was it again with plain docker to attach and get the log files? 
Uh, Docker logs minus F and then container ID. Thank you. Oof. Partition not found exception. That doesn't look healthy. So it's not the workflow. Broke and it's, it's just such a, the, the error message is so generic, you know? I got a command and I couldn't execute it. Okay, no kidding. Yeah. What well, was the command? It was a root cause. Um, not sure why that wasn't reported back. You see in the Java side, we see partition not found exception. Yeah. I mean, this is running with one partition though. So yeah, that means the deployment already fails. Um, wondering whether we're just too fast. I mean, you did wait for a particular message from the broker, right? Yeah, broker succeed, bootstrap succeeded. Yeah, I wait for that. And then as soon as I get that, boom. Yeah. Broker zero succeeded, partition succeeded. Mm. Partitions 101. Okay, maybe we should spend some more time debugging this. There you go, undefined <laughs> average TPS for that one. Yeah, test is over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know what, just for the sake of, of wrapping it up, uh, let me use the data that you already published and okay. just an approximation for now. So what would we see? Um, you reported, first of all, a we find the right value again here, 24.1. Time was 30 seconds. I mean, what I could do in order to make it realistic here, I could use 24, 25 seconds. Yeah, let me do that. So I will use 25 seconds here as a mark. Hmm. And then I can uh, properly com uh, compute uh, throughput and things like that. So first of all, we have the maximum number of workflow instances was 530 after 25 seconds. Oh wait, and that is in kilos. So I need to go 0 0.53. Um, So um, based on that, then what you also have running average workflows per second. So, but your workflows per second is the start throughput and not the completed throughput. Technically that could be another metric that one counts here. What I will do now is I will just, um, directly compute this against your workflow to go down to the FNIs. And you reported 30 workflows per second. I mean, we actually compute it right away, right? We just take your maximum um, divided, I think this needs to be divided by test duration and then this would give us 21 interesting you had 30 as a maximum and 21 as a running average exactly and apparently uh, yeah, it, it might make sense to use some ramp up before you measure um okay and now we need to divide this by oh my well i i actually w noticed that if i run it for an extended period it, it goes it, it really it has like a slowdown period mm -hmm. 
it like it goes real fast and it will slow down and it will come back like that it kind of breathes mm -hmm. it doesn't have just a steady throughput okay yeah okay so to, to just get one value out of it um i computed now the average over the entire run basically took the 530 total instances um divided that by the number of seconds mm -hmm. let me show the formula again and you should get 21 per second exactly i did and then i wanted to normalize it to be independent from the process and then uh, i divided that by the fnis that we calculated for your model so you see uh, process models b7 that's essentially um the 1.5 flow nodes that are executed each time you start a workflow. Okay. So it's a little bit with that 1.5, with a 0.5, it's a bit strange, but gives us some feeling of what was the FNI per second throughput. And FNI per second, as I said, is a cool metric because it is independent of the workflow. It's kind of normalized. <laughs> maybe, so maybe. It's comparable. Maybe, it's I don't know. Little, it, what it, kind of tasks you have in there yeah exactly it, it really that, that that one assumes that every flow node takes the same amount of time as every other one though right because i heard someone say if i put a parallel gateway and it adds a second to my workflow to my process execution like parallel gateways are more expensive than others mm -hmm. have you seen that yeah that is true. Uh, there is a difference in BPMN elements, but uh, I would say there is a certain tendency that the ratio of elements in a process between service tasks, gateways, and events uh, is roughly similar between the workflows. Um, yeah, one could, of course, also um, compute the metric here in terms of um, orchestrated services per second. Maybe if we do that real quick. Um, then we would probably take this times 1,000 divided by the duration and that multiplied with the <laughs> of service tasks, which in your case is 0 0.5. So it's it's really hard to. Next time that. someone asks me how many uh, how how many um, process instances can ZB start per second, I'm going to send them this video. Here's a quick answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. It's complicated. <laughs> it depends. What yeah. does it depend on? Here's a two hour video for you to check it out. <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Two hours and 15 minutes now. Let me just get the CPU formulas inside here. Some more complete picture. And that has the wrong columns. Okay. I think I have the formula somewhere else. I need to arrange them. So you could then compute the totals here, use that then as to compute the total of um, how much orchestrated services do you have per CPU or per gigabyte of memory. And then that gives a cost perspective to it as well. Mm. But yeah, obviously just starting workflows, it gives you some indication of um, at least also, you know, your test was between versions, right? What has changed? And um, for that version comparison, it certainly gives you some indication. If you want to understand a real workload, you want to be as close to production with all these configuration settings as possible. And in particular, the starter, the configuring the right start workload and having the right worker set up, that is pretty crucial in order to really understand how ZB works for your particular environment. 
All right, I think this could be a good moment to wrap it up. Okay. I got a bunch of uh, tasks to do on uh, on this garage benchmark, including figuring out what's going on with that error that it throws as soon as you start. <laughs> yeah, I would first of all try just to give it some more sleep. Maybe the lock message that you have been using here is not too eager. Perfect one. Yeah. You know, just give it some time. Maybe a second or two should be sufficient so that the broker is completely started up. I mean, I didn't see anything more in the log file here, but uh, yeah. Sounded like it started. I know, right? I'll, I'll sleep. Set the sleep for two, two minutes, two seconds. Yeah. Well, should we give that a quick try? If you. What sleeping it for two seconds? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Ready to pull when you are ready to. Ready to run. Okay, sleep. For two seconds before. Starting test. Okay, let's see if this does it. Dun, dun, dun. Push, 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 pushing the changes. Done. Okay. Would I need to uh, rebuild something, or is this just sufficient with DS Node? That's it. All right. Let's see how that goes. Here's the container. Um, started. That looks better. Mm. Race condition. Mm hmm. It's interesting that your performance is very, anyway, you've seen what my computer does. The CPU is going nuts all the time, mm -hmm. but yours is pretty so stable. Um, what? Now it's gone to 35 seconds. What? <laughs> okay. I broke something there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Looks like the timing <laughs> is not stopping. No. Well, I tried. I tried to make it an extra two seconds. Maybe I made it an extra two minutes. <laughs> Maybe, which would also be okay. Let's see. I'll leave this running and start capturing the data from this. Let me do add another line. Yeah, that's where. Then this, this is where it's getting tricky. Then. because obviously my highlighting is usually with the line before. I've already tried to play with the conditional formatting if, uh, if the highlighting could be done automatically. But anyway, let me just get this all the way copied. Now we are not on Josh Smack, but instead on Falco's P51 which means I have quite a different machine. I have fewer um, cores. Also, my maximum um, CPU is not that big. Uh, so I have actually fewer hardware than you have. Not sure, though, what the maximum is on my setup. I see this somehow in Docker. Let's assume those are just all the same. Um, physically, need to see. 
see I'm also on a terabyte SSD, which is a little bit smaller, but it's terrible. Um, so what am I getting here? Still running, by the way. Still going. It's never going to stop in that case. Probably. Let me just take something from here. So test duration. You know what? I'm right right at 200 seconds now. It's like my camera's frozen. Does it look like I'm frozen there? Let me check. Um, <laughs> yes, you do. Yeah. Oh man, I can't see. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that two second sleep is like, I don't know, changed the context or something. It could have done that. Weird. <laughs> what, the sleep changed your camera now? Uh, no, no. I'm, th I'm thinking about why it's not stopping running. Yep, it's still going. Capture this one here. Oh, this is exaggerating here. Let me kill some digits. I think oh, I could be able to just drag down the formulas. Yep. So I'm at 63 FNIs per second. I really wonder, Josh, what you do with your massive CPU that you're so out of resources. Um, you know, one thing that does it, Visual Studio Code, when it's parsing the AST and all the mm -hmm. stuff. Oh, it finished. The Look at it. Client. Apparently, you edit a zero. It finished after 300 seconds. Oh, really? Yeah. Or did I? No. Oh, uh, well. Okay, no, weird. Okay, I see what it is. Dude, this is crazy. Okay, so that, that thing that you passed in, right? With the yeah. minus... Um, minus 30, I'm time. pretty it's sure a, about it's, that. Yeah, it's a string. And then it, this is the magic of JavaScript, my friend. If I take that string and multiply it by a 1,000, it'll cast it to a number. But if I try to add 2 to it and then multiply it by a 1,000, it'll concatenate... It'll, it'll instead of casting the thirty-five to a number, yeah. it'll cast the two to a string, concatenate them, and then multiply that by a thousand, and it will cast the three five two to a to a number. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> so you know how I have to do it. I have to put plus program dot time plus two times one thousand. Okay, mm -hmm. that's crazy. Crazy. But it did uh, go down in the end a little bit. So I'm now at 52. That patch is called, um, my commit message is the magic of JavaScript. Great. <laughs> Oops, no, that was not what I wanted. So uh, when you have re performance reports like this, uh, you should always be a bit careful how much digits you put after the comma, right? So while obviously the computation will tell me something like, yes, it's, 52.62 but our measurement precision is nowhere near that so we should probably on the fni level just go to uh, a blank number maybe one digit after the comma after the like one decimal digit would be acceptable to measure like slight differences other than that it just wastes space in the table and doesn't give us any insights anymore. Or well, maybe uh, now that we are edit and we have multiple results, and there's one cool trick in uh, Google Sheets or in any spreadsheet program, you can do conditional formatting. And now um, format this with a color scale, for example. Uh, if you want to be really uh, 
visual you could use like a green red color scale and then um, it would color the different values in this case based on a percentile which is usually not what we want i would rather go for a percentage so that you have like a ratio between the um, between the different values so and now uh, when you do multiple measurements this color scale would judge the different measurements also maybe sometimes the red and green is a little bit too um, aggressive uh, sometimes I also just go with a white to green scale which is uh, yeah literally just between the minimum and maximum value and then gives us a scale that's cool yeah so then the, the fastest configurations would give us a green value and the other ones are just show as white spreadsheet spreadsheet driven development and then all you need to do is like on that gradient thing the last color you need to somehow write some javascript code that goes with it that redeploys your entire infrastructure onto that configuration automatically <laughs> <laughs> and so you know you got to copy and paste your master keys for aws into it yeah that's good <laughs> and, then that's, and then that's the perfection <laughs> Okay, and yeah, I guess now what I have changed here, again, usual highlighting would be I mark these as bold, so yeah, one can see what has changed between the different configs, right? And then, I don't know, you would probably go back to 30 for your testing, right? It would actually be a good idea to run with 300, you know, run it for five minutes, um, get a bit more stable before you post results. I take yeah, some more time to run it, but come on, running it for an hour or so is not too bad. Yeah, can I get my camera back? <laughs> so any, uh, what's, what's the conclusion? Any closing remarks about today's session, Volker? Um, yeah, I guess we can reiterate that when talking about performance and talking about concrete measurements or, you know, sometimes, for example, we have the people that show up in Slack or in, in the forums, um, that, that mention, yeah, maybe I have a topic here that my workload is not running as fast as I expected or something like that. Um, in those situations, it's really important to understand the complete picture, understand all the parameters, how they are configured. Um, it's okay to say that um, whatever was default is on default, but um, at least the parameters that have been configured for ZB to run, um, they are quite important. And also you could see for the starter and the worker, there are plenty of details to be in, uh, to be taken into consideration. Uh, we have said we have had situations where simply the workers were not configured in a good way to handle all the workload, and then once the workers are bottleneck, ZB obviously cannot help to make it faster. Um, but of course, there are also situations where ZB is the bottleneck, and then it makes sense to look into all these configuration parameters. I guess uh, what we should do is also share this spreadsheet publicly. Maybe you could even uh, post this together with your um, with your test results. Maybe even use this spreadsheet as a new way to report your test results. If I stretch yeah. it, yeah, 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 I can do that. That'd be cool. Then what would we do? We'd give people like commenting access on it so they can comment. Of course, yeah. And also the idea is uh, once this is public, uh, people can also use it as a, as a template for their own tests, right? Um, right. So you just um, easily take a copy of it, um, enter your own data, uh, capture, for example, your process model, capture your machine type, and then, um, yeah, really communicate about this in a very informed way. And I would even say this is still a, a software engineering solution to it. It's, you mentioned earlier that this is like a scientific approach. Mm. I think it's just a sensible approach to handle the complexity of describing a workload. Um, scientific method might even exceed that. <laughs> I guess the scientific part might be this, this technique that 
If you do change things, change one parameter at a time and understand the impact of it. Yes. Awesome. What a great, uh, what a great and valuable contribution to the community, Falco. This uh, spreadsheet is going to be a game changer. Yeah, I hope it helps. <laughs> it's a yeah. bit of a monster spreadsheet, and it's kind of funny how much time I spent in spreadsheet rather than coding lately. But uh -huh. it's help about to to talk about this and understand what's going on. Yeah, and it also opens up the uh, opportunity for the community can to contribute test results. You know, as as like a wider knowledge base, so we can gain more insight okay. from other people's activity. That's a very good point. Um, we are indeed curious to see different workloads and test results. So feel free to share those with us and um, yeah, maybe also ask us for your, for our opinion. Um, and maybe even collaborate on some of the scenarios that you're running. And it's great that we got a two hour explainer video to explain that spreadsheet because dropping that spreadsheet on someone without a two hour video to explain it would probably not be uh, so useful to them, right? Yeah, indeed, it uh, needs some explanation. Yeah, it's awesome. And well, one last thought about it is obviously you can also add your own data uh, just at the end of it. So the idea is I, I, when I work with different customers on this, uh, I keep the left-hand side of the table pretty um, standard. So I can also compare among different scenarios. And whatever custom columns I need that uh, are specific to a particular customer project, I would just add here on the right hand side. And you can see there are some columns here that I imported from somewhere else um, with some data. Awesome. Great. So, hey, do you want to uh, do you want to do this again or something else uh, in a couple of weeks? Yeah, let's see what topics we have coming up and uh, for sure. Okay. It's pretty fun. It helps me as well to get my uh, my thoughts straight. And I actually, I actually have a customer that I'm working quite intensely with this uh, at the moment, where we've already conducted more than 50 test series with different setups um, to just get down to the optimal configuration. <laughs> Epic. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks uh, so much for your time this this early morning in Berlin. That's fine. So uh, it was a good before breakfast session and now I will go and have some have some breakfast. <laughs> awesome. Mazel tov. Have a great day. You too. Have a great evening. Bye then.